Um, so we're going to lead off today with uh, with Brian Paul, who is the, I guess the the father of Mesa, um, and he's going to talk going to give a retrospective of twenty uh, ish years of the project. So so it's almost old enough to drink. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, so. Obviously, I've been working on this project for roughly 20 years now. When I was sort of doing the archaeology, um, I couldn't actually figure out if I started working on this in 92 or 93, but it was somewhere in there. Um, I'll tell you a bit, bit about, about, more about that in a bit. Um, I just want to also say that I haven't been to one of these XDC meetings in probably five, maybe six years. So uh, it's good to see all the new faces and connect with email addresses and personalities. and. Um, I've met a few of you last night and yesterday afternoon, so I hope I can meet more of you today. So, you know, feel free to uh, come over and introduce yourselves. So, Oop. and I'm already missing a slide. Okay. Um, well, my first slide was going to say uh, just some introductory stuff about OpenGL. Uh, so OpenGL was first announced publicly in 1992, uh, and that was on the, I think, comp.graphics Usenet news group, which I used to read a lot. This was all pre-World Wide Web, of course. And uh, I remember SGI posted an announcement saying, hey, we've got this new graphics interface called OpenGL coming out. We've posted the man pages, some sample code, documentation. Uh, download it, take a look at it, and let us know what you think. Um, and uh, OpenGL was sort of born out of IrisGL, which was its predecessor. And I had been working at the University of Wisconsin for about a year at this point, a year and a half maybe, uh, working on a visualization package written with IrisGL. And um, IrisGL was really terrible. I mean, it was great in that it gave you access to this really high-performance SGI hardware, but the interface was just atrocious. Uh, it was far more than just graphics, in fact. It had... Um, you know, a lot of the OpenGL concepts like rendering triangle strips and lighting and some basic texture mapping, but it also had things like create a window, uh, get the mouse location, uh, turn the keyboard click on and off, uh, turn the, the caps lock light on your keyboard on or off. Just anything you can imagine that you might want to use for a graphical application was thrown into IrisGL. So, um, and at this point, there was a lot of different graphics APIs. There's IrisGL, Starbase, PEX, FIGS, and some others that you've never heard of. And it was becoming pretty obvious that it'd be good for the industry to have a, uh, uh, to converge on a single API for all these workstations and all these applications. And SGI was pretty dominant at this point. So uh, they, I think they initiated the OpenGL project, but they worked with other vendors like DEC and IBM in the early days. And uh, so in 19, 1992, all this work came together. OpenGL was announced, and I jumped on it pretty quickly when I saw the Usenet posting with the FTP site for the docs. I grabbed all that, and I probably read it all within the course of a couple of days. And right away, I could tell OpenGL was just beautiful and slick by comparison to IrisGL. And I know that that's funny today. When you look at the OpenGL API, it's, it's grown and mutated to this horrible thousand function interface with 20 ways to do anything. But when OpenGL 1.0 came out, it really was a complete breath of fresh air, and it was really nice. So before I, I get back into uh, OpenGL Mesa stuff, I thought I'd go down memory lane a little bit and give you a little bit of background of where I came from and how I got into graphics and some of the projects that I did that led into doing Mesa. So my first computer was one of these, a TRS-80 Model 3. Um, I think it had 16 kilobytes of memory, and the first one I had was, uh, or had a access to was a cassette drive. And I just started playing with it in my spare time, or between classes and things. And I found that it had a graphics mode where you could set it up to display 128 by 48, not so much pixels as little colored blocks on the screen. It was monochrome. And in basic, they had three graphics instructions. Clear the screen, set a pixel, and clear a pixel. And I discovered those, and I realized I can make pictures on this computer screen with these three instructions. And I went crazy with that. So I, by the time I was done with the TRS-80, I'd written a paint program. And this machine doesn't have a mouse. It doesn't have cursor keys. 
So I used the keypad on the right to control a cursor, went up, down, left, right. And so if you can imagine painting with something that is interfaced, like Vim is used for text editing, that's sort of what it was like. But I, I was hooked on graphics at that point. So eventually I got my own personal home computer, and that was one of the Atari 800 XLs. Uh, and it was like a quantum leap from the TRS-80 in that it had color and fairly high-res graphics and a lot more memory. And it started off with cassette storage, eventually got a disk drive. Um, but I also had sort of discovered 3D graphics along the way. I think I picked up a book at a library one day, and it had some basic uh, computer graphics, and it just touched on 3D at then. I thought, wow, 3D stuff is really cool. I want to do some of this. So I, uh, you know, I got my math books and things and uh, started coding. And by the time I gave up on the Atari, I'd written a 3D modeling program, a 3D renderer using the painter's algorithm, which means basically just draw your polygons from back to front order to do hidden surface removal, and also did a ray tracer. And the, the epitome was that, of that was doing a 10-frame animation, which took two and a half days to render. It took six hours per frame to draw this thing, and it was just four colors, basically a you know, reflective sphere over a checkerboard, but it did an animated kind of thing, and um, I was pretty proud of that at, the po at that point. Uh, in college, I moved up to the next step, and that was one of these uh, Amiga 500s, and I had a full megabyte of memory, uh, which at the time seemed like a lot, but it really wasn't enough to do the stuff I wanted to do. So I wanted to do more 3D graphics on this thing, and it was a lot faster, more colors, more resolution, uh, but still, a megabyte of memory was not enough to allocate a Z buffer. So suppose I wanted to allocate a 640 by 400 pixel, 16-bit uh, uh, per pixel Z buffer. Uh, that's an order of 600 some kilobytes. And that was basically all the free memory I had on the thing. So there's no room left over for code or a color buffer. And so um, the other way of doing 3D rendering and hidden surface removal is with the scanline algorithm, where basically you transform all your triangles to screen space, pull it, put them all into a linked list, which is sorted from top to bottom, and then subsorted from left to right. And you basically walk along the status structure looking for triangle scanline intersections and filling in the pixels in between. Uh, eventually, I did a, a one-line Z buffer, so you could actually do a Z buffer one line at a time as you march down the screen, and uh, that was actually you know, a lot simpler and worked pretty well. Uh, but the main features I, I did at that point were lighting and dithering. You know, with only with you know, say 32 colors, you still need dithering to make things look a little better. And I did another ray tracer on that one too. So um, in the early 90s, I got out of college and started working at the University of Wisconsin, one of the engineering departments. And I got into the workstation graphics stuff big time. Um, in the early 90s, there were 3D workstations with real-time 3D graphics, SGI, Evans and Sutherland, HP. I think Tektronix had workstations back then, Apollo. Um, so the, there were these workstations, but they were really expensive. Uh, the machine we had was on an order of $180,000. It was something like 128 megabytes of memory. Um, you know, 24-bit display, which is really great. Um, and uh, so, of course, the price made it prohibitive for most people to use this kind of technology, even though they could, could have used it pretty quickly. You know, scientific, scientific visualization was coming up pretty hot in the 90s, and people saw that if, hey, you wanted to visualize something, and you have this 3D interactive workstation, that's just the perfect solution, but it was too expensive for most people. And, and back then, we had all these different vendors of different workstations. Uh, they all had their different graphics APIs. So uh, we were doing visualization software, and I think we targeted five or six of these workstations. So the graphics layer of the software targeted five or six different gra graphics APIs. So it was a mess, and I, you know, I had firsthand experience with all these things. Um, but it's, it's what you had to do at the point. Um, and so, yeah, I'd mostly been using Iris Shield at that point, and um, I'd gotten pretty comfortable with it, but like I said, it was pretty ugly. So when OpenGL came along, that was just, it, it was just obvious that that was the way to go. Um, but another thing was that, that happened was that there were all these workstations sort of in the mid-range and below, which didn't have 3D hardware, but they had nice 2D frame buffers, uh, either 24-bit color or 8-bit color. Um, so there were a lot of these systems around, but they couldn't run our software because there was no 3D graphics support on those things. Uh, and so the system that I worked on was called Viz5D. It's for 3D visualization of atmospheric models, uh, data sets. 
Um, and we wanted to port it to these Unix workstations with 2D graphics. And so uh, somehow, uh, this is before the web, I found reference probably in a Usenet news group to this graphics library called Vogel. Or Vogel. Uh, it was written somewhere in Europe. I don't remember who wrote it or anything. But it was basically a, a subset of IrisGL doing just sort of the core graphics commands. And I think it had functions for uh, doing you know, viewport, uh, viewports, viewing transformations, drawing lines, um, maybe a few other things, but it didn't actually draw filled triangles, and it didn't have hidden surface removal. And we needed those things if we're going to run Viz 5D. So I, I uh, spent, I don't know, a few weeks, a few months uh, enhancing this Vogel library to add filled triangles, z-buffering, uh, some basic lighting, and maybe depth queuing for lines that was important for us too. And I got to the point where that actually worked. Viz 5D ran on these 2D Unix workstations, uh, you know, very, very slowly, but it worked. You could put some images on the screen and get a better idea of your, your, your data sets, and that was, the, that was what really was important to us. So, yeah, OpenGL arrives in 1992, and SGI was spearheading the effort, and, you know, they wanted OpenGL to just replace everything else out there. And some companies, I think like IBM and DEC, were pretty happy to change and leverage this technology. Uh, other companies like Sun and HP were holdouts. They didn't really, they weren't so keen on open gel right away. It took them a while. Yeah, yeah. Figs versus open gel was a big hot topic on Usenet news groups for a while. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'd read the open gel docs, so I was familiar with it. And Having used IrisGL, which was so terrible, I knew, well, OpenGL is what I want to use as a graphics developer. It's better than IrisGL and better than Figs and Pex and these other things that I'd used. Um, but the other problem is that OpenGL was brand new. It was going to be a while before vendors actually had shipping implementations of, these, of this new interface. Um, and if you would have think that, you thought that SGI would be just immediately pushing as hard as they could to get this interface out there, but they didn't. It was probably... I bet in late 94, 95, before they actually shipped any OpenGL on any system, and it was probably two years later before they had it shipping across the board. So it's like 96, 97, actually. IrisGL was still pretty prominent then. Uh, <coughs> so, so I saw OpenGL here, and I had this Foggle library here. It became pretty obvious to me what I wanted to do. I wanted to write my own graphics rendering library using the OpenGL interface to replace Vogel and IrisGL and stuff like that. And so I believe I started coding uh, in 92 or 93 at some point. Uh, I went through my old, well, actually in the Mesa website, it says I started in August 93, but I'm not sure that's actually correct. Because um, I know I, I grabbed the specs for OpenGL pretty quickly and started coding pretty quickly. Um, uh, and I was uh, first developing at home in my Amiga system, and a while later I realized, well, these Unix systems are work are a lot faster, better compilers. I want to target those things as well. Um, and I used uh, the old floppy disks to haul the code back and forth in my backpack from home to work every day. And I think somewhere in the corner of my office, in a box somewhere, I still have a stack of floppies, which might still have the original source code from when I was doing this. And, so when I get home, I'm going to dig for this and try to find it. And there should be some date stamps in these files. And I should be able to get a better idea of when about I was doing this. And I have a feeling it was late 92 or so. Um, and also, the fact that I was developing both for the Amiga and uh, uh, Unix workstation running, running X, Xlib, uh, that, was, that meant, oh, I needed like a device driver interface in here somewhere to sort of handle both of these interfaces. And at that point, it was really just a matter of uh, the device driver being able to plot pixels on the screen in a certain color. There weren't any triangle drawing functions or anything like that. And of course, vertex arrays didn't exist. It was a matter of just getting pixels on the screen. Um, so the device, device driver interface is very simple at that point, and it evolved over time as, as, as needed. So by the end of 94, I had been plugging away at Mesa, though at, that, at this point it wasn't even called Mesa. It didn't really have a name. It was just a bunch of files on a floppy disk. And, um, but I worked pretty hard on this all through 94. Um, 
I think I had a lot more spare time back then. I'd work on the evenings, work on Saturdays and Sundays sometimes. Um, so by the end of 94, I had a pretty complete OpenGL implementation, though I didn't do things like MIT mapping or some of the anti-aliasing routines. Um, and there was the, the glue library on the side, which I'd done maybe half of it, but there were some big chunks I didn't even touch. And I thought, well, hey, I've got this code, and I've been using it now for a project at work to some extent. Um, this might actually be useful to some people out there. And so I thought, well, let's, I should try to look into open sourcing this thing. And the first thing I did, of course, well, I, I, I thought was the right thing to do was to call or uh, contact SGI and say, hey, look, uh, I wrote an implementation of your new API. I'd like to open source it. Is that okay with you guys? And, you know, um, some companies, you know, suppose it would have been Microsoft that did OpenGL. If I'd have gone to them and said, hey, I'd like to open source this interface of yours, you know what the answer would have been. Uh, but SGI has some, has some really pretty reasonable people. Um, I contacted Mason Wu, who's actually one of the co-authors of the first edition of the Red Book. And I think he was OpenGL product manager at that point. And uh, a bit surprisingly, he was really open to the idea. He said, this sounds really cool. Let me talk to our people here, and I'll get back to you. And uh, we had a little bit of back and forth on this. And, um, they, and they said, go for it. The only, the only real restrictions on me were uh, don't use the letters GL. Don't call it you know, free GL or something like that. Uh, and also, please insert this disclaimer, which is still in the Mesa doc somewhere, saying uh, Mesa is not an official OpenGL implementation. It uses the API and acts like OpenGL, but it's not officially OpenGL. Um, but, you know, by... Actually, now, there, now it is official OpenGL. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have the certification to prove it. <laughs> yeah, I, I should probably take the... I could probably take the disclaimer out because SGI, as you know, it doesn't exist anyway. So, um, And as far as the name Mesa for the project uh, is concerned, it really it's just a name that popped into my head one day. Maybe I saw it somewhere and I thought, hmm, that sounds like a good name for the project. And I really didn't put a lot into that. And to be honest, to this day, I, I still don't know what else I would have called it. <laughs> so uh, the name stuck and it worked, so there you have it. Um, uh, so the other thing, uh, you know, the reasons I think SGI were kind of receptive to this free version of their OpenGL was that, um, A, they wanted to get this interface out as much as possible and have as many people using it as possible. Um, so I think they saw my open source version as a way to sort of, you know, push that goal forward that, you know, if, if an OpenGL library wasn't available for your computer XYZ, you could download Mesa and, you know, be there 90% of the way. Um, and, and, and like I said, OpenGL implementations were really scarce at first. It was years before it sort of took off and started getting momentum and, and becoming widely available. So um, I think uh, Mesa really filled a hole in the ecosystem for a long time. So finally, I got permission to open source Mesa in early 95. And it was called the 1.0 beta release. And uh, I went, announced it on the Comp Graphics Usenet uh, uh, news group. And I, I, I put it out there. I didn't have really any expectations for what people would, how people would, would react to it, if it be of interest to people or not. I didn't really, really have a feel for how much interest there was for OpenGL outside of myself and uh, the, the little bit of talk on the mailing list. Uh, but um, within days, it became clear that there's a ton of people out there who want to get into 3D graphics and use OpenGL. And before I knew it, I knew it every morning coming to work, my email, my inbox would have dozens of emails with people saying, wow, this is really cool, or thanks a lot, we're using it for this and that, and by the way, here's some patches to fix some bug we found, or uh, it didn't compile because of this, this uh, you know, idiosyncrasy of our compiler, so here's a patch. And uh, so I, I, I needed to get a little bit more organized. And so, gee, there's this thing called the World Wide Web nowadays, and I should maybe make a web page. The, the first web page I ever made was for Mesa. Uh, you know, the web was around for some years at that point, but it, it was just sort of getting traction. You know, the Mosaic web browser had just come out the year before or so, and uh, the web stuff was kind of new to me too, but uh, I thought, well, yeah, a web page might be good for this project. And then, uh, oh, how about a mailing list? We can actually 
I, so, so I could sort of remove this, move the discussion out of my inbox to something that works for a group of people, just rather than myself. Uh, so, so the whole project really ramped up really quickly in terms of uh, the, the the people using it and contributing to it and and discussing it and things. Um, and I didn't have email access at home, so uh, I was trying to do this like early hours in the morning before I started my real work, or in the evenings, or on the weekends. And uh, you know, my, but my supervisor Bill Hebert was really supportive. You know, he saw that this this library could be really useful to people. We were using it for our project at that point, so he said, you know, if you need to spend a couple hours a day uh, tending to email and patching and fixing and stuff like that, then go ahead. So. Um, you know, that really worked out great for me. So I, in many ways, I owe Bill Herbert a lot of credit for where the things I've done and the, uh, the things I've learned over the years. So what were some of the issues in the big, or some of the big issues in the early days of Mesa? It's kind of some of the stuff we still see today, compiler issues. You know, back then, Mesa was running on, say, six or seven prominent workstation uh, systems. And every workstation had its own variation of Unix. We had Irix and Irix and AIX and HPUX and um, SunOS and things like that. And the compilers were all different, and so a lot of the headaches came from compiler incompatibilities and making the code as cross-platform as possible. Uh, another big issue was actually just displaying images on your screen and getting a nice quality image. Uh, back then, uh, you know, 24 bit displays are pretty expensive. Uh, I'm not sure there are many uh, affordable PC cards with 24-bit graphics. They're most all 8-bit, occasionally 16-bit per pixel. And so dealing with color maps and dithering was a huge thing back then. Um, uh, years ago in X servers, if you had an 8-bit display, you could basically allocate a color map per window. And as you moved your mouse from window to window, the color map would get swapped out, the hardware color map. And so you'd be looking at this window with your mouse pointer, and it looked fine. Move the pointer out to a different window, and all the colors would go haywire. And it was a mess. So there's this thing called shared color maps. So we tried to allocate, uh, Mesa tried to find the shared color map and allocate its colors out of that, and then find out which colors were available to it, and set up dithering tables, and use that when you're drawing. And then HP had uh, something called HP Color Recovery Dithering System, which simulated 24-bit color quality with an 8-bit display if you use certain dithering patterns in just the right way. And so, you know, <laughs> we spent days and weeks just working out dithering patterns and trying to improve the image quality on the screen like that. It seems crazy today, but that's the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, I fought with in the early days. Uh, another issue I had was that I was working on Mesa and had no revision control whatsoever, <laughs> except maybe some uh, occasional snapshot of backup files copied to some other directory. Uh, I had used SCCS in the past, but I didn't have it in my SGI system, and I don't think we had RCS at that point. And it wasn't. I, I don't know if it was just not installed. I don't know, but would it? Okay, okay. I don't. I don't remember having it for some reason. So anyway, um, I didn't have revision control for quite a while. I, I think I'd have to guess the date that I started. So I had started, at some point I did start my own revision contro control. And then um, SourceForge, or the predecessor to it, whatever it was called, was like one of the first early open source web-based project hosting things. And um, uh, the guys at VA Linux had started this. I guess it was VA Research back then. And uh, somehow it got connected with one of the guys there, and they said, hey, do you want to host your project on our new website for open source projects? And I said, sure, yeah, it sounds great. And so I think that was roughly 97, 98 maybe, when I finally had public hosting of the source code in a proper revision control system. But for a long time, I didn't have anything at all. So um, Another issue in the early days was performance. Um, yeah, you know, this is back in the days when a PC had like a, say, a 16 megahertz 386 processor or something like that. And workstations were quite a bit faster, but still not super fast. Um, you know, calling, <laughs> uh, 
Mesa and uh, interactive 3D graphics was kind of a stretch sometimes because as soon as you tried to draw more than say a thousand triangles per frame, you know, it was pretty slow, jerky kind of motion, especially when you're doing you're spending all this time doing dithering calculations. Um, so performance was definitely an issue in the early days, and I did spend time trying to optimize things as much as I could, but uh, you know, machines were slow back then. Um, I said, so I had these problems, but on the other hand, OpenGL was still pretty small back then. The API had maybe a couple hundred functions, I guess, if you consider all the different vertex and normal color variations. Um, it was not that big, and the feature set was not that complicated. And at this point, I'd pretty much still written every line of code in the system, so uh, it was all in my head. It's easy when I got a bug report to know exactly where to go to and how to fix it. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, today when people take a look at the Mesa project, I think it's approaching a million lines of code altogether. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming, but in the, in the early days, um, it was small and fun and uh, it's just uh, great fun for me, to, for, for me to work on it. So the late 1990s got really pretty exciting. This is sort of when 3D is taking off. Workstations are getting cheaper and the first of the consumer level 3D hardware is coming to market. So NVIDIA had like the Rage One or Riva 128, ATI had, oh boy, what were they called? Uh, pre Mach 64, yep. Uh, Matrox G200, G400, 3D effects Voodoo. Was, I, I think the Voodoo was probably one of the first consumer 3D cards that really took off at a, you know, had a fair price point. Remember I went down to CompUSA and bought one for I think 300 bucks or something as soon as they came out. Pardon? Monster 3D. Yeah, 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 yep. Um, so I grabbed one of those. Uh, but anyway, so these 3D cards for the consumer are starting to arrive. Their price points are fairly reasonable for what they do, I guess. Uh, but at this point, they're still uh, programmed either with usually Direct 3D, which was sort of new for hardware graphics, uh, Glide, which was the 3D FX interface, or some other one-off API that the vendor came up with. Um, there was actually very limited OpenGL support at that point. You know, there were some, uh, I think 3D Labs was more professional oriented, so they had some 3D, or they had some OpenGL drivers for their stuff. Uh, but otherwise, there wasn't too much. In NVIDIA, yeah. Yeah, they were pretty early with OpenGL support, yeah. Uh, this is also the point where SGI open source some of their GLX code for the client server sides for indirect rendering. Uh, it was some years later when they actually opened the uh, sample implementation. So um, I wasn't directly involved with it, but this project called the Utah GLX project cropped up where some guys uh, were looking at these consumer 3D cards and looking at Mesa and thinking, wow, it'd be great if we could do a hardware driver for Mesa so we'd have open gel in these cards. And um, so the Utah GLX project started off, and it was uh, a driver, uh, it was a server, X server based driver extension where you'd load a driver into your X server for 3D, and you'd communicate to it through the GLX protocol over the wire indirectly. So there's no direct rendering at that point. Um, but the Utah GLX project attracted some pretty talented developers. Uh, one of them was Keith Whitwell. He got involved in that, and he was kind of between jobs at the time, I think. And uh, uh, so he jumped into Mesa, and I was just blown away by how quickly he sort of tore things apart and rewrote things to, for example, improve vertex transformation speed. Because these early cards uh, handled 3D uh, rasterization, you know, texturing, Z buffering, blending, stuff like that, but they didn't do vertex transformation. You had to still do that in software, and that was usually a bottleneck. So Keith got involved and optimized vertex transformation and stuff, and he was really on a roll. Uh, but he needed a job to survive and pay his rent and stuff. And John Carmack, of all people, had gotten involved in the project too because he wanted. He, I think, I don't know all the details, but you know, he was working on Quake and Doom and that kind of stuff, and wanted hardware acceleration. And I think he was interested in graphics or 3D graphics and OpenGL stuff. So uh, I think he got involved for a bit. And when he learned that Keith needed some funding, well, he you know, uh, contributed $10,000 to the project. He actually sent it to the project and asked me, well, what do you want to do with it? And I said, well, Keith Whitwell is doing some great work. 
it would be great if he could continue. He needs some income. So I basically just uh, handed it off to him. And in the late 1990s uh, was when Precision Insight was formed uh, by Jens Owen and Frank LaMonica. Uh, I think it was the four of you that started it. And um, they were doing uh, contract driver development work for X386. And uh, they recognized that 3D was a big thing coming down the, down the horizon or down the road. And, um, you know, they were aware of Mesa. And I met Jens and Frank at SIGGRAPH uh, 99, I believe. And they said, hey, it'd be really great if you get involved in this project. We want to do it and join our company. And, and it took a little while. But in September of 99, I joined Precision Insight. And for the first time, I could work full time on OpenGL and Mesa and GLX and X server and stuff like that. And uh, that's sort of a, a turning point for me because before then, this was all spare time uh, work for me. So getting to more recent times here, uh, in the 2000s, uh, the DRI, which was developed by PI, uh, really got traction. Uh, it's obvious we wanted to have direct rendering to maximize the performance of our, our Mesa OpenGL rendering on these cards. So they developed the DRI, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, PI was acquired by VA Linux. VA Linux went through the dot-com bus like everybody else, and we all got laid off. And then Jens and Frank and Keith and I uh, started um, uh, Tungs and Graphics in the fall of 2001. And so it was like Precision Insight version 2, kind of, because we wanted to do the same kind of work. We wanted to develop uh, uh, 3D drivers for consumer hardware. So we continued that work all through the 2000s. Uh, in 2008, that's when Keith Whitwell started the Gallium project. Uh, he sort of took a, back, uh, took a step back from the Mesa code base, looked at it, and said, well, we've got this device driver interface, and it's OK, but it doesn't really do, it's not really a good match for what real graphics hardware looks like. Um, you know, things, things kind of diverged at some point in terms of the software and hardware with graphics. You know, SGI was out there in front with their graphics hardware and their API, which was, you know, designed for that hardware to be efficient. So it's, you know, per vertex uh, drawing kind of stuff. Uh, the PC graphics cards came along, and they weren't really designed that way. You know, they were more that idea of set up a vertex buffer with a whole bunch of vertex data, ship it to the card, and render it. And that wasn't really a great match for, uh, for OpenGL at that point. You know, OpenGL added vertex arrays, um, but it was kind of after the fact. Um, so you know, Keith was looking at the uh, Mesa interface and thinking, well, this is kind of, there's kind of a mismatch here. Let's try to put in a new interface, which is a better match for graphics hardware, which, uh, which we will target in Mesa as a device driver interface. And that's sort of, you know, some of the things, well, and he also saw that there was a lot of code duplication going on between drivers. And Gallium was a way to sort of refactor things and organize things a little better so that uh, dr drivers are really just device drivers and not open GL drivers, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's where that came from. And also in 2000s, of course, that's when we had programmable shading come on the scene. So we had uh, NVIDIA, I think, was the first with their Vertex uh, program extensions. And that quickly led to the OpenGL shading language from 3D Labs and OpenGL 2.1. So here we are uh, today. Um, uh, so in 1993, I had no idea that this project would be successful and last into you know, 10, 20 years later. Um, you know, I, I guess I sort of had the frame of mind that you know, once OpenGL takes off the vendors, They'll all just do their own OpenGL libraries for Windows and Linux and put it out there, and there won't be any need for Mesa anymore. But it seems like there's always some reasons for Mesa to uh, persist anyway. Uh, even to this, this day, people still want software rendering. So people still use the old software Rast code and LVM pipe for things like that. Uh, the OS Mesa interface, people still use and need that stuff. Um, and luckily, open source in general has been a pretty successful area. And so people recognize that having an open source graphics uh, graphics driver is a value. They can take it and adapt it and use it for all kinds of new projects. 
Uh, but yeah, like I said, uh, I didn't expect the project to go the way it did. Um, you know, we've got hundred, well, many active developers today. There's been hundreds of com contributors, maybe a thousand over the years. Uh, there's commercial funding for Mesa development, which I never would have dreamed of my you know, wildest that uh, would happen. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, somebody at VMware asked me, well, how big is Mesa? How much code is there? And I did a really rough um, word count scan of the tree. Does that include, okay. Does that include all the gallium stuff and, okay. Uh, that's not the number I came up with actually, because I did it. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Are you just word counting or are you, is that not include comments or something? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm surprised Eric, by that. Eric, Eric gets 1.2 mil. So, and the so yeah, I came up with over a million myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, the what's the static analysis tool? Coverity. Yeah. So they have they have stats, and we're right behind uh, GCC. So oh. they better watch out. <laughs> okay. And that uh, does not include. Uh, well, so the question is, do you include? code generated files like the GLAP dispatch. Okay. All right. Well, great. Um, so yeah, naturally I did not expect the project to grow to the, grow to the size and complexity. Uh, like I said, in the early days, I knew every line of code I could jump in anywhere, fix a bug anywhere. Those days went away oh, 15 years ago, I think. <laughs> um, I have neither the time and in a lot of cases the interest to go off and debug any random piece of code under the, in the Mesa tree. Uh, so it's, you know, quickly grown beyond, grown beyond my uh, capacity to, to hold it all in my head. Um, Mesa is probably found in most any Linux distro now, which is pretty amazing. So that means there's millions of people out there that are using the code uh, probably on a daily basis. Um, I, it blows me away sometimes when I think about it. Um, and in, in general, I think everybody would agree that this has been a really successful project. Um, so what are the, some of the keys to the success of the project? Um, well, I always say that Mesa was the right project at the right time. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, 3D graphics were taking off at a certain point in time. I had a job at, a right, at the right place. I was on Usenet news groups at the right time. I had a background in graphics and 3D. And, you know, if I weren't the person to have started in open source OpenGL, I'm sure there would have been any number of other people right up behind me who would have done it instead. Um, another thing I've always sort of kept in mind as I've worked on the project is, um, I think in the early 90s, Fred Brooks did a presentation where he discussed uh, uh, likened computer software or computer uh, programmers to being tool makers. And I always liked that idea. Um, when I was at Wisconsin doing this visualization software, uh, we were serving a community of scientists who depended on the software to do their jobs every day. And that really instilled in me the fact that I'm just, I'm, I'm, not, the, the, I'm not the end of the, the, the project here. I'm, the, I'm a means to the end. I'm pr providing a tool that somebody else uses to do their job. And I always like the feeling of that, knowing that I'm doing something that I enjoy, but somebody else is really making good use of it. And... Uh, uh, in the early days, that was all about scientific visualization, engineering, stuff like that. You know, nowadays it's probably more so it's entertainment. So it doesn't somehow feel quite as, maybe as noble as it used to be, but it's still pretty cool. Um, the other thing I said before is, you know, the code has a long time ago grown, grown beyond my capacity to handle it all. So um, I found that when somebody smarter than me comes along, and there's a lot of you out there that are smarter than me, and you want to jump into something and take over, I step aside, let it happen. You know, I'm not going to get in the way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm still valuable and doing good work <laughs> some days, but uh, a lot of you out here today have been doing stuff that just blows me away. It's really cool. Um, the other thing I like is that the Mesa development community has been pretty civilized. Um, you know, I, I always like the golden rule, to treat others as you like to be treated yourself. Uh, so, you know, no insults, 
don't scream at people, don't call them names. You know, there's other open source project leaders who do that kind of thing, and I just, I, I just don't like it. So I'm really glad to be involved in a project that has a fairly good reputation for being friendly to newbies, and uh, uh, people generally get along. Uh, probably the most significant reason, I think, for the success, success of the project, though, is that we have a specification. Consider for a moment if we we're working on a graphics API of our own design. You know, we have disagreements about how things are implemented sometimes, or structured, or organized. Can you imagine the, the, <laughs> the battles that would happen if we were designing the API itself and specking out the interface for users and developers? Some of you, yeah, <laughs> some of you can. I, um, you know, the ARB is doing that today, and I've sort of stepped back from the ARB in years, in the recent years. I was pretty involved with them for a while, but um, you know, I just got tired of the battles, I guess. I've never been a big uh, fighter for things, so, uh, you know, like I said, thank God we have a specification that we're following. We have somebody laying out the roadmap ahead of us, and we're just, you know, we're the carpenters actually building the, the, the building the house that somebody else designed. So, uh, just to wrap up, I want to just uh, uh, thank a few people. I mean, um, th like I said, this project has grown far beyond anything I would have imagined, and uh, that's because all of the, had some really talented people jump into the project, contribute, and take it far beyond anything I could have done myself. Um, uh, yeah, I've been super impressed by the work that other people do, um, whether it's device drivers or compilers or the infrastructure like Keith did on Gallium. Uh, uh, just amazing work that I never could have done myself. And finally, uh, the project, the Mesa project, has sort of been my calling card. I can go almost anywhere in computer graphics circles, and people know my name, and I've gotten to know so many people in the, in the industry because of that. Uh, it's just amazing. Some of my uh, uh, closest friends I've met through the Mesa project. And uh, I could probably travel almost anywhere in the world and find somebody that I've had a, uh, a relate relationship th with through the Mesa project. And that, that I think also is a very cool fallout of this. So, And that is the end. Um, I don't know if we have time, or right on the, the button, I guess. But if anybody has any quick questions they want to ask, that'd be fine. Keith. I just to thank you for doing so much work for so long and creating a great open source project. <coughs> I just wanted to thank you for doing so much work for so long and creating this great open source project that we can use today. Well, thanks. I think I'm thanks. right with saying that we should all thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had one other question. As an old Amiga geek, what uh, what compiler did you use on the Amiga? Uh, I was programming in Modula 2. Um, there were C compilers, but Modula 2 was kind of, it had its moment where it kind of got some traction in the mid-late 80s, I guess. And I liked it. I had done some programming in Pascal in college. And uh, when I saw Modula 2, well, I guess the reason I got Module 2 in my Amiga was because it was cheaper than the C compilers. I think I got a compiler for 100 bucks or so, which at the time was a lot of money for me. And so that's what I used. Um, at some point, though, I switched over to, I think it was the DCC Dillon's compiler on the Amiga, Matt Dillon's compiler. <laughs>